I traveled to Houston, Texas to talk to Dr. Vody Bakum about what the scripture actually says about discipling youth. Dr. Bakum, good to see you. Good to see you, man. Yeah, Thanks for coming. Too. Simply, we don't have any age-graded ministries, um, and we do that on purpose. We uh, have an emphasis on family discipleship and equipping families to do what God's called them to do. The issue is we start with, we have to get man to respond to God. That's our goal. Therefore, whatever makes man respond is appropriate. That's the wrong starting point. Rather than going back to the scripture, to the biblical foundation, men are still looking to psychology. They're look, still looking to pragmatic solutions. They're still looking to ways to somehow put the pieces together without just following the basic biblical drawing book. When it comes to being innovative and trying to reach the culture and doing things that are not found in the scripture, trying to worship God in ways that God has not told us to worship him, um, then our innovation becomes dangerous. Uh, for example, the, the great example of this in the Bible is Uzzah. You know, the Philistines have captured the ark and they've taken it away. They send the ark back. Now, the, the ark is coming back and it's being carried in and it's falling down. Uzzah sees the ark falling down and he wants to do something good. He, he loves the ark. He loves Israel. He wants to rescue the ark from falling onto the dirt. And he reaches out and grabs the ark in a way that God has not expressly told Israel to touch the ark. And God kills him. Is it possible the crisis we're seeing in the church today is a form of God's judgment on the church? For reaching out its hand and in a sense doing something completely against the command of God to solve a problem with the youth? So what you're saying is the scriptures are binding and they don't leave us an excuse. So Philip, we, we, we don't believe that the church has the freedom to go invent itself. It needs to go to God. You know, the apostles were authoritative, they were inspired. What they, what they did was inspired and, and we should emulate it. Paul said, we have no other pattern, follow my pattern. So what were the, what were the patterns in the New Testament? They were always age integrated, never age segregated. We should follow that pattern. Scripture has a lot to say about whether ministry should be age segregated or not. There is an authoritative binding testimony upon the church. It's the Word of God and the Word of God alone. So what is that example in Scripture? What, is, what does it look like? All the meetings of the church, Old and New Testament are age integrated. In the Ephesian church, in the Colossian church, the children were right there in the meeting of the church. The Apostle Paul in his letter addresses the children specifically right along with the parents and this whole body. He does the same thing in the Colossian church. It, it illustrates you know, men taking, you know, younger, younger men into their lives, older women discipling younger women in the church. It's organic and it's, and it's, it's definitely not programmatic and it's absolutely not age segregated. One might say, well, they weren't dealing with the same issues that we face today as a culture. Youth ministry is a way for us to speak to the crying world, needy world, in need of direction and spiritual leaders. God's, God's patterns are transcultural. They work in every culture because they're from God. Uh, all, people, our pe all people have the same sin nature, but God's word is true in every culture. And God, God has designed his church to become his people in a corrupt and pagan world. You guys worship together as families on Sunday. And you do that because of why? I do that because I see in the scriptures, from the Old Testament to the New, uh, in the Old Testament you find the assembly of the believers, the Jews. It was men, women, children, sometimes suckling babes. In the New Testament you find uh, Jesus, for instance, in the Gospels, um, having his disciples when the children wanted to come and hear him teach and to be around him say, get out of here. And he said, suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me for of such is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And I just see that and I think of the modern day churches how a lot of times you'll come to the, to the back door to come into the, to the sanctuary and an usher will tell you, I'm sorry, but your children cannot come in here. I was inspired by Pastor Houston's love for the children in his congregation and his desire to reach them the way he saw in scripture. 
not with programs, but entire households coming together with the rest of the church body each Sunday. Well, the Bible has a very clear pattern in the Old Testament and the New of young people being, number one, in the worship of the community of faith with their parents. Where we go to Deuteronomy 6, where we go to Psalm 78, where we go to the book of Proverbs, where we go to Ephesians chapter 6, where explicitly we see the scriptures teaching parents to communicate the truth to their children, to do it on an ongoing basis. When you rise up, when you lie down, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, one generation teaching another generation. We see this over and over and over again. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It is absolutely clear that parents have that responsibility. So, to learn more about this, I head into Colorado to meet with Kevin Swanson, radio show host and church leader, who focuses specifically on effective Christian discipleship in the home. I was desperate. I was so desperate, I went to the Word of God. As I looked up children in, in the concordance of the Word of God and found Ephesians 6. Uh, and it turns out Paul doesn't have much to say about youth groups. There's these verses, these key verses. Ephesians 6, 1 to 4. It's very simple. What we do is we stand up and we say, fathers, bring your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Fathers, you're responsible. Tag, you're it, man. We were here to equip you, to encourage you, to do whatever it takes, but man, you're it. And then we turn to the children and say, honor him, listen to him, follow him. The reason that the faith is falling apart is we don't have men who love God with their heart, soul, mind, and strength enough to teach their children God's word as they sit in their house, as they walk by the way, as they rise up, as they lie down. If, if they love God with their heart, soul, mind, and strength, they would disciple their children whom they love to the God they love. There's gotta be more love for God here. It comes down to a man standing at the cross of Jesus Christ and seeing the blood drip from the hands of the Savior who died for that man. And if he understands that love man, he's going to go home and he's going to love God. And he's going to love his children. He's going to disciple his children to the God he loves. We have direct commandments in the scriptures everywhere that men are supposed to teach and train their own children. So we have gone with a plan B. Do you see that? And you can pour money into it, man hours into it. You can give your life for it, but it's plan B. It isn't the plan that God recommended and commanded. And so even if there's some success in a youth group, it still doesn't make it biblical. And if it's not biblical, it's not right. What I'm seeing is that the problem isn't just what's happening in the church. The problem is what isn't happening in Christian homes. It seems Christian parents have been negligent in carrying out their duties to disciple their own children. All right, so we got the fathers teaching at home. They're doing their job, instructing their children in the way of the scriptures. But what's wrong with continuing on with the ministry as well? Yeah. Well, there, there's actually a huge movement in the church toward that, to maintain age-segregated ministry and try to activate fathers. But it's like, it's, it's mixing oil and water. It's, it's mixing the ways of the world with the ways of God. And that always produces bad fruit. Well, well we're, we're thankful that there really is a resurgence of equipping of fathers to play their roles. At the same time, if you continue to, to do something that's, that's foreign to Scripture, you're, you'll, you'll just continue to corrupt the church. That's one of the greatest dangers of youth ministry. It has literally turned men's attention away from their real duties and has given them an alternative, an easy alternative for disobedience. And it's been very, when it becomes as popular as it has become, it's so easy for men to fall back on that and say, because the church authority says this is acceptable and spiritual, and the way that things have always been done, well, I'm just being a good Christian by going along with it. And so it's discipling men in the wrong direction. I had assumed that the quote-unquote radical youth ministries were the ones that were failing, the ones that were nothing but crazy fun and games. But while rethinking everything, I met a youth pastor who asked to remain anonymous in order to protect the reputations of the families in his church. My team of youth sponsors and myself have really worked hard to develop both a curriculum that focuses on Christ and a very sober approach to Scripture and elevation of the Word of God. Not one of these uh, crazy youth pastors that uh, pushes the limits of what parents in society would 
would call uh, youth activities, but uh, very conservative and very intent on strengthening the home. After seven years of youth ministry, um, with the graduating class this year, probably 20% make a solid profession of faith. And the other 80 are either on the fence or have turned their back on God. And, and my heart breaks because what did I do wrong with the other 80%? If even the most diligent attempts to run youth ministry programs with serious and godly content are ineffective, it seems to affirm my growing understanding that no matter how you do it, conducting age-segregated programs goes against scripture and simply doesn't work. Uh, when I became a dad, um, realizing that these kids wanted to hang out with me rather than their own parents, wanting to do activities with me and be hanging out with the cool guy and instead of wanting to hang out with their, their dad. And that really struck my heart because I want my son I wanted to be a hero in my son's life. I wanted to be the one that he comes to and asks hard questions. Yeah, I've had parents approach me and say, you really need to meet with my kid. Okay, what's going on? And they'll lay out the situation. And my question would be, okay, I'll be glad to meet with your kid, but before I do, tell me, what did you say to your kid about that so I can make sure that I'm working in concert with you and not working against mm -hmm. you? And jaws hit the ground. And I'll say, well, what did you say to your kid? Well, I haven't actually talked to him about it yet. Oh, really? Okay. I believe that the, that the view that the youth group is a necessary part of the church is the exact manifestation of the tradition mindset that the Reformation fought against. Boyd Dillinger was once a youth pastor himself, but now lives in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and the pastor of a family integrated church, a church without formal age stage or life stage programs, but brings the entire congregation into worship together. 